Uh, my, my dad is what some people would call a uh, numismatist. Um, now that's not a bad thing. It actually means a person that collects coins. He doesn't just collect coins. That's been his full-time profession as long as I can uh, remember. So I grew up in this world of coin collecting and coin shows. That's our family. Uh, I, I share it all the time. Like I don't know how you make money selling money, but we always had food on our table. And so this last week, I asked my dad to send me a picture uh, of a few coins that they currently had available. One particular coin caught my attention. It's this small golden piece from ancient Rome. I'll, I'll show you a picture. It's on the screen. There is the coin. In 238 AD, there were two joint emperors, Gordon, Gordian I and Gordian the second, and they died. The Roman Senate appointed two older guys to take their place, and the Roman citizens and the military really didn't like that, and so uh, they murdered uh, several of the leaders and then made 13-year-old Gordian III the new emperor of Rome. So while uh, he was successful as a, a emperor and ruler of the Senate, he later died at the hands of Philip, which is a rumor, the troops, his own troops built him, built him this tomb in Persia, and it read this on the tomb. It said to the defied Gordian, conqueror of the Persians, conqueror of the Goths, con conqueror of the Sarmatians, queller of mutinies in Rome, conqueror of the Germans, but no conqueror of Philippi. And so it's Gordian the third whose face is actually stamped on that ancient coin, and my dad shared that because that coin is, is so rare and that it's in such excellent condition that just small little piece um, of money is worth $16,000 and uh, just a glimpse of this wild world of coin collecting the more rare the more valuable the item is and yet when we look at our nation it isn't money, it isn't power, it isn't opportunities, it isn't opinions that are rare. Oh no, we've got plenty of that. We are a nation of abundance, full of people with opinions on the way they think, the, the way things should go. No, the reality is what is rare today, what was actually rare for the people of Israel in 1 Samuel, what is rare today is the word of the Lord. The most life-changing, soul-turning, eternal, lasting word of the Lord is rare these days. We've got opinions. I, I mean, I've got, I've got opinions. But we don't gather on a Sunday to hear from man. We gather on Sunday to hear what is increasingly rare in our culture, and that is the word of the Lord. So I want to show us from the passage today why we need to hear from the Lord. We'll be in 1 Samuel 3. We're going to tackle the whole chapter today. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. Uh, if not, all there, it's all there in your bulletin. But before we read uh, the narrative, let's pray together. God, we, uh, we come before you this morning and just confess that our lives, our minds are full of things that we just want. God, we want to be successful. We want more money. God, we want a better job. God, we want relationships that aren't going well to be fixed. God, we want so many things. And in that want, God, we have just neglected the biggest need in our life. God, we need to hear from you. We need the word of the Lord. And God, so help us as we, as we read 1 Samuel 3, a story of a reminder that the word of the Lord was rare in those days and how it is rare today. God, show us our need for you. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So let's read the story together and then we'll walk through it. 1 Samuel 3, verse 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel 
was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There were no frequent visions. And at the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord told or called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you, you called me. But he said, I, I didn't call you. Lie down again. And so he went and to lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and arose, he went to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli perceived that it was the Lord that was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do something in Israel, at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And on that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken against his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity he knew because his sons were blaspheming God. And he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel, he, he lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And, and Eli said, what, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more if you hide anything from me, all that he has told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew. The Lord was with him and, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Verse 1, it sets the scene for us as we walk into chapter 3 of the study. The boy Samuel, the child of Elkanah, and Hannah, the child vowed to the Lord, the child given to the Lord in Shiloh once he was weaned. This child is now ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Meaning, meaning the, the boy is mentored by Eli, the high priest, on how to be a priest. And you might be thinking, wait, um, are we talking about the same Eli from the past five weeks? The same guy who fattened himself with the meat from the sacrifice, the same guy that allowed his two terrible sons to cause all kinds of wickedness in Israel. Uh, you're saying that that Eli is mentoring Samuel. Yes, because God is sovereign over all. And God is, in his sovereignty, will use even wicked men and women to unfold his plan of redemption, as is the case of Eli, even mentoring his replacement. But look at the startling setting in the second half of verse 1. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There were no frequent visions. The reason Israel was in such a mess has just been given to us. The word of the Lord was rare. Why was it rare? Well, people did not know the word, nor did they teach the word. And you can see that all throughout the book of Judges, if you were to read that for yourself. People were not given any prophetic visions from the Lord because their hearts were hardened in their own sin. So let me put it like this. Israel was at its worst. Just read through the Old Testament. Israel was at its worst when the word of the Lord was forgotten and not proclaimed. 
Oh, the word was rare in those days. And I want to make the very serious accusation this morning that the word of the Lord is rare in these days. And oh, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we quote Bible verses. We pick out passages to defend whatever political agenda that we have that week. To be, to be a culture that's saturated in the word of the Lord, that one's rare. And if I can press further, it's even rare in our churches. The place to hear and proclaim the word and preachers have exchanged their calling for TED Talks and halftime speeches. It wasn't a pandemic that turned the church upside down. It was a pandemic that exposed churches for what they really valued. And what we all found out real quick was that we have a bunch of people and a bunch of churches that call themselves Christians, but they don't really care about hearing the word of the Lord. Why was Israel a mess? Because the word was rare. Why are churches a mess? Because the word is rare. Why is your life a mess? Because the word is rare even in your own life. So, what, like, what hope do we have in that? What, what hope do we have in that kind of darkness? It's the same that it's always been. This is John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let me show you why Israel needed the word of the Lord to shine into the darkness. Let me show you why we need the word of the Lord today through the story of Samuel. Just two points. Um, here's point one. Why do we need the word of the Lord? The word of the Lord is needed for people to know the Lord. Verse 2, you find out, yeah, Eli is, he's not dead yet, but he is getting older. His eyes were growing dim so that he could not see. Now, to be sure, the writer is revealing to us more than just his physical situation, but also his spiritual one, that Eli could not see the purity. You can see that you can, couldn't see the purity of Hannah in chapter 1 when she's praying in the temple. Eli could not see the evil of his two boys as they desecrated the sacrifice. Eli's spiritual eyes were growing dim. And I wonder if our eyes are growing dim as well. Like, can you really see the evil that is happening around us and even in us? To be sure, before you can hear from the Lord, you got to see clearly. Are your spiritual eyes growing dim? It's, it's not a sign of old age. It's a sign that you are spiritually dying. Which is where we find Eli in verse 2. He went to lie down in his own place. And then we see Samuel. He's actually in the heart of the temple. He's caring for the lamp of God, which is referencing the golden lampstand in the temple. You can see this described in 2 Chronicles 13. So for reference, 2 Chronicles 13, starting in verse 10. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. We have priests ministering to the Lord, who are sons of Aaron, the Levites, for their service. They offer to the Lord every morning, and every evening burnt offerings and incense of sweet spices set out the showbread on the table of pure gold and care for the golden lampstand that it, its lamps may burn every evening for we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. And then we also see Samuel lying down near the ark of God. Well, you might be thinking, well, what's in that ark? It's a great question. Uh, Hebrews 9 verse 3. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, and having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. So you see these contrasting people in this story. You got Eli with spiritual eyes that are growing dim. He's at sleep at home. 
And then you have Samuel being prepared for the priesthood, and he's asleep in the temple. And all was normal and quiet. And the word of the Lord echoed in the darkness. Samuel. The startling voice uh, heard from the young boy, and he jumped up and he said, Here I am. I took off running where his mentor laid. Here I am, Eli. You called. And Eli, he just kind of brushed that off. He said, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. Samuel, the Lord called again. Immediately, Samuel, he went to Eli. Here I am, Eli. You called. Eli must have been a little bit more confused this time. He says, my son, my son, that wasn't me. Go, go back to bed. Samuel, the Lord called again. The third time the boy runs to Eli, he says, here I am, you, you called me. And it, it was only then that Eli began to connect the dots. It was only then that Eli realized that it was the Lord trying to speak to Samuel. Could it really be? And the word of the Lord was just so rare in those days. Samuel, go, go back to bed. And if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so Samuel went back to his room. You and I need to realize that we need the word of the Lord if we ever want to know the Lord. And you see that clearly in verse 7. Verse 7 mentions that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And I find, when I'm just reading and studying, I'm like, that, that verse is so strange when I look at this narrative. Because Samuel, who is even ministering to the Lord in the temple, in verse 1, that Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word had not yet been revealed to him. Friends, um, people get saved when they hear the word preached. Your co-workers are not going to get saved because you're a nice guy or gal at work. Your family members are not going to get saved because you provide things for them. Your friends are not going to get saved because you listen to Christian music around them. This town is not going to get saved because they showed up at the Harvest Festival. People are saved when they hear the word of the Lord preached. Eternal lives are changed when the gospel is proclaimed. There is no substitute. There is no other way. It's Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have not, never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they're sent? That is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. People do not know the Lord for two reasons. These are the only two reasons that will ever exist. This is extra. I said it was, I guess I'm cheating. I said it was two points. Here, let me give you two extra points under point one. So letter A and letter B. People don't know the Lord for two reasons. Letter A, they haven't been told the word. They haven't been told the word. The boy in... Samuel in verse 7, he doesn't know the Lord yet because the word had not yet been revealed to him. Some people have never heard the word revealed to him, them. Some people, even in Carter County, have never clearly heard the gospel. That they're dead in their sin, that they're separated from the holy God because of their sin. That they're going to receive the full wrath of God for all of eternity. That Jesus, the Son of God, lived a sinless life. He died on a cro cross. That Jesus took the wrath of God in our place. That Jesus rose from the dead. That when we believe in Christ, we receive the full righteousness of Christ in our lives. Some people, even in Carter County, have never heard that. They have never been clearly taught the word. But like Samuel, 
you can serve the Lord and not know the Lord. Like you can act like a boy in the temple and minister to the Lord your entire life and not really know the Lord. There is no substitute for preaching and it's not just preacher's job. The people you love most deeply will never know the Lord if they never hear the word. Which is why Eli, he finally does get something right in verse 9. He tells Samuel to say, hey, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. People don't know the Lord because they haven't been told the word. Some people don't know the Lord, is let it be, because they don't want to listen to the word. They don't want to listen. If you remember from two weeks ago, the sons of Eli were described in 1 Samuel 2.12. That verse says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men, and they did not know the Lord. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are priests in the temple. These guys are from the tribe of Levi. They come from a family line of priests. So it wasn't from a lack of access to the word of the Lord. No, they had access, and I would say they even understood it well. They just didn't want to listen. Some people in our lives don't know the Lord because they don't want to listen to the word. Maybe they don't like church. Maybe they think the Bible is a giant contradiction. Maybe they've been burned by Christians in the past. Maybe, and I'd say this is the majority, maybe they just don't want anyone to tell them how to live their lives. There's a million reasons why people hear the word of the Lord preached, but don't really hear the word. And it's, it's sad, it's frustrating reality, even as, I, even as I teach this morning, some people don't want to hear it. And they'll be respectful, and they'll listen while I'm talking, but they don't really want to listen to the word. It is the same warning given to the king of Judah, Josiah's son, in Jeremiah twenty two twenty one. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not listen. I mean, that's been your way from your youth, that you have not obeyed my voice. Those are the only two reasons people don't know the Lord. Either they've never heard, or they've heard and their hearts have grown hard and callous. The question is, do you, do you want to see people know the Lord? Do you, I mean, do you want to know the Lord? And not just know the Lord so you can get into heaven. Like, but to really, do you really want to know the Lord? And if you answer yes, if we answer yes, the book is the only answer. That's why expository teaching, the very first value of our church, because we know that we, like, we want to know the Lord, therefore we must know his word. Why do we need to know, or why do we need the word of the Lord? Let me give you point two. The word of the Lord is needed for people to know the honest truth. Not just truth, the honest truth. So Samuel, um, he's back in his bed again and just waiting for the Lord to speak. And we get to verse 10. It's just more shocking to me than the others. Because the Lord is done just speaking to him. The Lord, Yahweh, stands before Samuel. And he calls Samuel as other times, Samuel, Samuel. And I think like, man, what a crazy scene for this young kid to be in the quietness of the temple, to have that little flicker of light from the golden lampstand, to know that the Ark of the Covenant is in the next room, and then to have the Lord stand before you. And so Samuel, he responds like he was told, speak for your servant hears. Now whatever Samuel <laughs> thought the Lord was going to say to him, I don't think he was expecting what he was about to hear. Maybe a like, hey, Samuel, it's me, Lord. We've never met. Nice to meet you. 
Hey, Samuel, don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. Hey, Samuel, I love you, buddy. Like, you are, you're, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Everything's going to be okay. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And the Lord's first words to the boy Samuel is a promise of destruction of his mentor in verses 11 through 14. Behold, I'm about to do something big in Israel. Everyone's going to be talking about it. Everything I said about Eli's house will be fulfilled. Everything from beginning to end. I'm about to punish Eli's house forever for the sin that he knew about and the sin he did nothing about. And I promise this, Eli's house will never be forgiven by either sacrifice or offering. And that's it. Samuel got to hear that for the first time. News to him, yeah, sure, Eli had heard that before. We saw that last week when the man of God told Eli that prophecy. But for Samuel, that's the first time he heard about it. The Lord was going to destroy his mentor and his mentor's entire family. And the Lord would never forgive that family, whether by sacrifice or by offering. What did Samuel do after hearing that? I can tell you what he didn't do. He didn't sleep. <laughs> Verse 15 says that Samuel, he just laid there until morning. Certainly doesn't go back to bed. He waited until morning and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And so how is he handling the news? It says he's like he's scared. He's afraid to tell Eli. I think we all be. Wouldn't we be a little nervous as a young man or young woman to share about the promised destruction of someone in your life? And that doesn't come from like some fortune cookie. It was a promise from the Lord to Eli that Eli and his house would be destroyed. We need the word of the Lord because people need just, they just need to know the honest truth. People need to know what the word says. People need to know where they stand before the holy God. People need to know that their sin is ruining themselves and those around them. People need to be confronted with the honest truth and not truth that's repackaged into something it really isn't. Honest truth from the word. And the honest truth to Eli is actually the same truth for us today. The Lord will not save Eli in his house because they've rejected the sacrifice of the Lord. They have ruined and dishonored the sacrificial system. There is no forgiveness for anyone. There's no salvation for anyone that wants to reject the sacrifice of the Lord. It's the same truth for us today. Every sin in your life, and it's true, every sin in your life, past, present, and future can be forgiven. And it really, it really doesn't matter how normal or gross your past is, you can really be forgiven through the sacrifice of Christ. However, there is no forgiveness or mercy for those that reject Christ. So if you want to ignore the sacrifice of Christ, you'll receive the same promise as Eli did with his family. You will be destroyed forever. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's the honest truth. That's why Samuel is afraid to tell Eli. It would just be difficult to hear. At the very least, Samuel understands that. It's real. People need to know the truth. I need, I, like I need to know the truth. And we're not, we're just not going to find that in textbooks, on the news, in social media, we need, hear, we need to hear the truth from the Lord. And there's a lot of people out there that don't want that. And they're going to sit there and tell you they want honesty all the time, but they don't really mean it. People only want the good news, Isaiah 30, 9 through 11, for there are rebellious people, lying children, Children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. 
leave the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Some people don't want to hear what is right. They just want to hear smooth things, illusions of better days, without actually being confronted with reality. It's the same warning from Paul to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears so they'll accumulate for themselves teachers that suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The word of the Lord is rare in these days. And so many people come to church just to hear preachers that tell good stories or have excellent illustrations or that offer helpful life advice. For the time is here and now and people will leave the honest truth of God's word and they'll follow teachers that just make them feel better in their own desires. Maybe it's a different preacher. Looking at the time, maybe it's a preacher that preaches shorter sermons. Maybe it's a person on TikTok. Maybe it's a YouTuber that just makes them like, oh, that person really, they finally understand me. Whatever it is, they are turning away from the word of the Lord. Eli finally does call Samuel in verse 16. He says, here I am. He says, son, what did, what did the Lord tell you? Don't hide it from me, Samuel. Whatever he said to you, Tell me the whole truth or it will happen to you as well. So Samuel, he spoke the full prophecy and he spoke the word of the Lord to Eli and hid nothing. It was the honest truth. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him, replied Eli. I spent, um, I spent over eight years in full-time student ministry at one of the healthiest churches that I've ever been a part of and during that time, I, I learned what it meant to be a shepherd and what it meant to love people and what it meant to organize and plan things as a leader and what it meant to teach the word. But to be fair, I, I hardly felt like I was making any difference. And our senior high students, they met on Sunday nights. Our junior high students met on Wednesday nights. And I I'd, I'd teach them the word every single week. And I'd spend hours preparing messages and praying and getting ready for youth group. But if I'm honest, like I, I, I can't remember too many times where I left a ministry night and just felt like there was some good things going on here. Progress being made. I had given my life to the study and the proclamation of the word of the Lord. I couldn't see how any of it was making a difference. Before we moved uh, to East Tennessee, the students and leaders had put um, together like a special last night of youth group um, before we moved. And we had food and cake and just a time to talk about uh, stories and memories that we had all made together over the years. And I'll never forget the end of that night because without my knowledge, the leaders had prepared students to get up and to speak and just one after another, students stood up front and they read letters that they had written about how thankful they were for me, how I'd been there for them through difficult seasons. And one after another, students thanked me for teaching God's word. And I was just overwhelmed with gratitude. I left church that night like filled um, with encouragement, knowing like it's just not all for nothing. The, good, the, God, the God's word was just at, at work even when I couldn't see it. And we need the word of the Lord to know the Lord. We need the word of the Lord to know the honest truth. We need to know that when we teach the word, it's just not for nothing. God is at work in ways we hardly ever notice in the moment. Isaiah 55.10, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, 
but it will accomplish, it will, that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word of the Lord will not return empty. The word of the Lord will succeed. And as Samuel grew, the word of the Lord was with him, and none of those words fell to the ground. And the word was being established from northern Israel to southern Israel, and all throughout the nation people realized that Samuel was going to be the prophet. And God revealed himself again to Samuel and Shiloh by the words of the Lord. The question, I usually give you a, a main point. Sometimes I'll give you a question. Here's your summary question. Have you heard what the Lord has spoken? Like, we don't need to wait for a prophet to speak to us. Jesus has already spoken. And we have the written word of the Lord. Have you heard? I mean, you need to. You need to know the Lord. You need to hear the honest truth. Have you heard what the Lord has already spoken? If you want to talk about anything after the message or just want someone to pray for you or give your life to Christ or join the church, whatever it is, we'd love to talk with you, but let's pray and then we'll sing um, our last song together. God, we're, we're thankful for the promises of, of your word, knowing that, that no person here knows you apart from your word. In every person, including myself, we just need to hear honest truth, hard truth. Truth that's not sugar-coated, truth that's not repackaged as something it's, it was never meant to be. We need to hear the truth from your word. That it changes us, it changes how we think, it changes how we feel about other people. It changes how we see you. Father, we need your word. Help us to be a church. Um, that, that stands on that, that will not compromise that. Um, God, and so we're thankful for just the confrontation and confliction and the encouragement that your word gives us this morning. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.